you have your Bibles, would you please open up to Hebrews chapter 10, if you're not there already. Uh, this morning, we're going to be looking at verses 11 through 18. And as you're, stu- as you're turning in there, uh, last week we studied really plainly and, and saw very clearly how Jesus removes or separates us from our sins. Now, the old covenant, which you know as the Mosaic covenant, only covered your sin and never separated you from it. And according to the law of Moses, sacrifices were to be continually made on your behalf. Under the old covenant, there was always a constant reminder of your sin as you had to go back in time and remember all the things that you were to be confessing on the head of that animal before it was sacrificed. But with your faith in Jesus, all of your sin has been forgiven. Your past has been removed. The moment that you place your faith in Jesus, you're forgiven of your sin. And then guess what? You're immediately separated from it. We use that analogy uh, from, actually it was was a biblical analogy from uh, the night that Jesus was crucified where uh, Peter chopped off Malchus's ear. You remember that? What a vivid story. He swung his sword, lopped off Malchus's ear, and it fell to the ground. We know that Jesus picked it up and healed it, told Peter to put away his sword. But in Hebrews chapter 10, it says, for it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. That's the same word that was used to describe his ear being taken off of him. It was a separation that occurred. And Even though this is true for us as Christians, that the moment we are forgiven, we're separated from our sins, it should go without saying, and I think it needs to be said, that there are actually consequences for sin in this life, though you may be forgiven of them in the next. If you break the law, if you you do something that is wrong, consequences don't go poof, gone. Hey, God forgave me, man, lay off as you stand before the judge. Uh, Your consequences don't vanish, though God will forgive you. God's grace is sufficient to cover your sins. But because of this truth, many have taken God's grace and have used it as a way of continuing in sin. You don't continue in sin that grace should abound. It's pretty much like saying, God, just put that on my tab. I know I'm running up a big one right now. Just put it on my tab, Lord. I know that you'll forgive me when I'm all done with this little uh, uh, season of sin that I'm in. You're missing the mark terribly with that type of attitude. Yet through Jesus, there is a continual process of sanctification that takes place in our lives. And for those of you that don't understand what sanctification is, you can jot this down. It's really the process of you being separated from the world. It literally means to be set apart. And there is a work of the Holy Spirit that is sanctifying you on a daily basis. This isn't a work where it's just one and done. That was Jesus' work on the cross to pay the price for sins. But as you live this life, there's a process of you being more like Jesus and less like yourself, where he must increase and you must decrease. And additionally, the process of sanctification is at work in separating you from your sinful state. And what will happen is that the Holy Spirit, as he's at work, you will find, and maybe you've already discovered this, that there is a preemptive work of the Holy Spirit saying, no, I think that would be a bad idea. I think that would not be a good thing if you did that. There preemptively, the Holy Spirit works in you, sanctifying you. Yeah, you know, the old Garrett used to do that. I don't think that's a good idea now. That's sanctification. And so the Holy Spirit will show you And there's also a conviction of sin where the Holy Spirit shows you through the Bible as the lens for your sin that you need forgiveness. And so you have the work of the Holy Spirit to hold you back from sin. And if you do commit sin, the Holy Spirit convicts you so that you would be drawn or that you would be turned to Jesus for forgiveness of sin. And then through that confession of sin to the Lord, you find that God instantly He forgives you. He cleanses you from all unrighteousness. He separates you from your sin. Often, it's the case, and I know it's been for me, where it's hard, even though God has forgiven me, for me to forgive myself. Or realize spiritually that 
that's not who I am anymore. That's the past. God has forgiven me of that. And it separated me from that. And so often we can say, well, I can't move forward into what God's called me to do because of my past mistakes. And there couldn't be anything further from the truth. If you confess your sin, instantly you're forgiven. And you're separated from that. And you can move forward in doing what God's called you to do. Because when you sin, and when you give in to sin, it's almost like you put a roadblock in front of you and, uh, so that you can't move forward into God's calling and what he's called you to be a part of. And only God can make this possible through faith in Jesus. And we read in chapter 2, verse 10. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And then verse 11. And every priest ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. And so in verse 10, Jesus is offered once and for all. In verse 11, looking back at the old covenant, it says the priest stands ministering daily, repeatedly offering the same sacrifices. And those sacrifices can never separate you from your sin. So of the priesthood of Aaron under the Mosaic covenant, if you were a priest, it was more than a full-time job. I mean, can you imagine, you know, picture it now, you know, these priests working around the clock as they offer sacrifices for people's sin. You know, maybe they're even thinking to themselves, you know, man, will these people ever stop sinning? I've had it. Oh, here she comes again. Let me guess the same thing. Oh, here we go. You know, it's the most sin I've ever seen. You know, that's why we kind of joke about at baptisms, we hold, you know, the, the more sinful people under the water a little bit longer, just so we make sure we, it gets off, and then we, we bring them up. But can they just give it a break? You know, come on, the same sins over and over and over again. But the priests were human beings just like us. I mean, honestly, it had to have gotten old after a while, because man can never remove sin. He can only add to it. Man can never, let me say it again, man can never remove his own sin. He can only add to the pile. And that is probably one of the most fundamental and most important understandings that you can have. We cannot do a single thing to separate ourselves from our sins. The only thing that we can do in our own strength is add to that list of sins that we have already committed. I mean, talk about making matters worse. When I sin, I'm sinful. When I try to cover my sin, I'm deceitful. When I try to compensate for my sin, I become self-righteous. You might just ask, well, who then can be saved? Well, man cannot save himself. And he can't save someone else from their sin. You know, I can't save you from your sin, and I'm your pastor. I mean, it'd be like me saying, hey, you want to be forgiven of your sin? All right. Meet me in the back after service and bring the cash. We'll make this happen. It doesn't work like that. It's impossible for man to remove man's sin. Jesus does for sinful man what sinful man cannot do for himself. And in verse 12 we read, For this man, Jesus, after, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. And from that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. You know, I don't know if it was just because of the close proximity to Easter, but when I read, but this man, it was very reminiscent to me of that centurion that stood at the foot of Jesus' cross, where he said, truly this man was the Son of God. This man, Jesus Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice for the sins of the world. Instead of the lamb that would be slain over and over and over again under the old covenant, the perfect lamb of God laid down his life once and took away the sins of the world. Jesus offered himself in our place. And that one-time sacrifice sufficed. He did it. It was done. It was finished. From Acts we read, and I like to Read verses 9 through 11 of Acts chapter 1. And if you like to turn there, you can. It says, when he had spoken these things, while they watched, Jesus was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while his disciples looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, 
men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. This picture of Jesus ascending into heaven. Again in Acts from Stephen the first martyr and it's chapter seven. If you like to turn there, I'll just read two verses from chapter seven of Acts, verse 55 and verse 56. But Stephen, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Jesus. From Acts chapter 1, we have the account that he ascended into heaven. From Acts chapter 7, Stephen, our first martyr in church history, says, I see Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Jesus is in heaven. But there is a time where he returns to the earth. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, it says, Therefore God has also highly exalted Jesus and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now years ago when I was on staff at Calvary Chapel of Costa Mesa in the early 2000s, before, way before we, we started this church, there was very interesting things that would take place. A lot of crazy stories. You know, a lot of wild things, I think, just where it, because it was a, a high-profile place and there was live radio and there was a whole bunch of things working and there was always just some kind of crazy that was happening. You know, for years when I started this church, I used to speak to Richard, who was, our, who was at, our, at that time our, our security guy. He'd been with me since Monday nights at Calvary, and he came over here. And every week on Monday nights, I would say, hey, Richard, anything crazy happen? And he's like, oh, yeah, this happened and that happened. And then, you know, I'd ask him here. You know, hey, Richard, everything good? And anything crazy happen? No, nothing crazy. And then weeks, and then weeks turned into months, and months turned into years. There was nothing crazy happened. I'm like, this is great. Nothing crazy happens after church or during church on Sundays. So don't get any ideas, any of you. We're on a great streak right now. But you would always be so happy when somebody uh, would share a story of something that, you know, that was good that happened. And there was this young, young guy who came out of Buddhism. He gave his life to the Lord on one night. And, and he started attending a young adults fellowship, which, by the way, will be starting. It's going to happen. If you guys have been holding out, that is going to happen. Uh, but he was attending a young adults study. And he didn't know the first thing about anything in the Bible other than what Jesus did for him on the cross. And that he knew that he had sinned and that he needed that forgiveness. And so that's why he gave his life to the Lord. And one day he shared this very interesting dream that he had. And, and I'll give you the bullet points of it, but he just basically said, and, and granted, he has no knowledge of the Bible. He's new into faith in Jesus. And he says, you know, I had this dream. And in this dream, there was this major battle that was this battle that was taking place. And he described it with modern military, you know, uh, equipment and vehicles and tech. And there was these tanks and all this kind of stuff. And there was a lot of fighting that was going on. And he said, and then out of nowhere in the clouds, the clouds parted and this giant light just shone, like just brilliant white light. And then he says, and this main dude comes down from heaven and he lands on the earth. And, and, he, and then he says, and he stands there. And he says, everybody started bowing their knees to this, main, he called, as you know, if you study the Bible, that main dude is actually Jesus. And he comes down and he stands on the earth. And he said that every knee started bowing to him. But then he had this really, really concerned look on his face as he started, you know, or finished up the story. He said, but then I just heard this screaming and this agony. And then I heard the sound of things like two by fours breaking and he said that those that did not choose to bow their knee were made to bow their knees and knees were snapping all over the place and I had never heard anything like that in my life and this man that was sharing the story didn't know the scripture every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord 
but he described it in great detail. And I think I'd rather choose to bow my knee than to have my knee forced to bow. So Jesus is in heaven as he waits for what we read in verse 13 from that time as he ascended into heaven, as Stephen, as I mentioned, is in Psalm in heaven, he's waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. It's interesting that this would be the term used, that his enemies are made his footstool, because in Isaiah 66 verse one, it says this, thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Jesus reiterated the earth was God's footstool in Matthew 5, 35. In Isaiah, it says that the earth, Jesus, Matthew 5, the earth, and then here in Hebrews, it says his enemies are his footstool. This, I believe, is speaking of Jesus reigning over his enemies who are on earth where, where he will have complete and total rule. For mankind, earth, his creation, has rebelled against him and his enemies will be overcome and every knee will be made to bow. Jesus will rule on this earth. And it makes perfect sense for Hebrews to describe his enemies made his footstool and then the other two passages in the Bible to say the earth shall be made his footstool or that the earth is his footstool. He's gonna rule and reign. But for those of you here today who have faith in Jesus, he calls you his friends. As Jesus is quoted saying to his disciples in John 15, 15 b, he says, I have called you friends for all things that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. And so too, because of what Jesus did, because of what we receive, we are no longer enemies of God. In Romans 5, 10, it says, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Reconciled, made right. No matter what you've done, forgiven, cleansed, separated from your sin, as far as the east is from the west, it doesn't touch you ever again. What a blessing. But there is coming a time, and I feel like, Many who are righteous in their hearts or at least desire righteousness after God's own heart are grieved by the things that we're seeing here on this earth where wickedness has abounded. There's really nothing new under the sun as the scriptures tell us, but things seem to have begotten exponentially worse. They, th they, they seem to have become way, way, way more wicked than ever before. And we think to ourselves, Lord, will you not judge this? Lord, will you not take care of these, your enemies? And it grieves your heart when you see the things that are happening around the world. In our own state, our own county, our own city. For those of us that have children, especially, we're concerned. Is the devil has come to seek and to, sit, uh, and, and to kill that which Jesus desires to save. He wants to maintain that state of mankind being lost in their sin. But we do take heart because there is a day coming where all of Jesus' enemies will be defeated. All those who have practiced wickedness and have done evil in the sight of God will be judged. Nothing is hidden from his eye. He sees everything. And to him, we will give an account. But this world isn't lasting forever. The life that we have is short. And of all of Jesus' enemies, 
that will be defeated, the last enemy that will be defeated, we read of in 1 Corinthians 15, 26, where it says, the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. And that leads us to the promise given in Revelation 21, 4, which says this, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. That's the hope that we have in Jesus. That's the hope that we have to look forward to. That this world, it's not going to keep on going as it has been. We have seen throughout history, and you can have a degree in it, or you can just go grab an encyclopedia or go Google it, that nations that rot from the inside come to a swift and total end. That's why the church has been set out to do, has been sent out to do the work of evangelism. The work of using good things as a platform to share the gospel. That we're, the, that we're to be the salt and the light of the world. We're his people. And do we pray over our city? Do we pray over our state? Do we pray over our country? Lord, have mercy on us. Because things are getting bad. But even so, we say, Lord, come quickly and help us to be faithful with what you've called us to be faithful with. David Guzik said this, and I quote, the incarnation leads to his perfect life. His perfect life leads to his atoning death. His atoning death leads to his resurrection. His resurrection leads to his ascension to glory. His ascension to glory leads to his return and triumph over every enemy, end of quote. So, verse 14, Hebrews 10, for by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Let that marinate for a moment. Would you read that quietly to yourself in verse 14? Look at that again. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Let me make this as clear as it possibly can be. In the sight of God, Jesus' sacrifice has made all who believe perfectly righteous in his sight. In the sight of God, Jesus' sacrifice has made you who believe perfect. He sees you as righteous in his sight. And this process of sanctification, your sanctification process is past, it's present, and it's future. He is presently working in you and he will continue to work in you. He, even now, this very moment, as you sit in that chair, God is sanctifying you. Whether you feel it or not, whether you notice it or not, God is sanctifying you. Every single moment of every day, he is working through his Holy Spirit in your life to make you more like his son, Jesus, and remove more and more of your sinful desires, actions, responses, thoughts, that you're becoming less and less and less like the world and more and more and more like Jesus. That you're actually different from those around you. The hard part is, is if you line up, you know, say 10 people. Half of them say they're Christians and half of them say, no way, I'm not. The problem is, is that often what you'll see is that there's no lifestyle difference in any of those people. The only difference is one professes that they have faith and the other says, no, I don't. And in some cases, people would even say, why do I need faith in Jesus? You're a Christian and I'm not even as bad as you. 
Sanctification is the process of being set apart from the world, set apart from the world's way of living and speaking and thinking and feeling. This sanctification process is meant for you to be so separate from the world that there is a tangible, there is a visible difference in your life that people see you and they glorify God. That's what it was supposed to be. That's what it should be today. And if there is no sanctification, if there is no setting apart of your life from the rest of the world, then there is a problem. And usually it can be fixed very simply through repentance and holy living. In verse 15 it says, but the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us For after he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds I will write them. So not only did Jesus' one time sacrifice perfect those who are being sanctified, we find that God writes his will upon their hearts. You're changed. My desires align with God's desires. My will aligns with God's will. And this is the promise of the Lord that he would transform you from the inside out. The inside out. Every one of us, the inside out. Inside out. Inside out. Why do I need to keep saying that? Because for every person in this world apart from faith in Jesus, it's the outside in. Outside in. I clean up the outside, it makes its way inside, and it never, ever works that way. For it is impossible, verse 4 of Hebrews 10, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. The issue for sin is the heart of man. Out of the mouth proceeds the issues of the heart. The things that I do stem from my desires in my heart. See, the issue with sin in the heart of man is so serious that no outward covering could change the heart. The old covering The old covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the priesthood of Aaron was a covering. It didn't separate you. It didn't change you internally. And all religions apart from faith in Jesus are man's attempt to cover or compensate for one sin. But it's not possible for any external effort to detach you from your sin. And this is where people go astray. So Jesus says that he will work in your heart. He will work in your mind. And then that work that takes place as you are born again or made alive spiritually, as now your heart has God's handprint on it and he begins to mold it and shape it. Now your thoughts are being purified by the word of God. You'll find that now that internal transformation makes its way outside to the external in the way that you live, the way that your light shines. And then he adds in verse 17, their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. Now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. So God does not remember your sin for it was done away with when Jesus died on the cross. And for the person that has had their sins forgiven, there no longer remains the need to offer a sacrifice for sin. And so big picture, we see contextually, Those Christians that were in Jerusalem coming out of Judaism and the law of Moses and all the extra things that were placed upon them. And then the simple truth of the work of Jesus and fulfilling the law of Moses with his life, with his sacrifice for the sins of the world. 
So if you're forgiven through faith in Jesus, there is no need for another sacrifice or anything that you can do to make up for your sin. But not only is there not a need, there are no sacrifices. There is nothing that can be offered in Jesus' place. Nothing exists. It might make you feel better, but it's like, you know, that, that old movie where you're walking through the forest, clicking sticks together and warding off mountain lions. It doesn't work. It's nothing. So this whole idea that I have to add to my good deeds to compensate for my bad deeds, it, it, there is nothing that's in existence apart from your faith in Jesus that can separate you from your sin. Not one single thing. So there's no law, there's, no, there's not only a need, there is nothing that could even fit that need. Jesus is the only way. And that's what he's saying here in this letter. So anyone doing anything outside of the work of Jesus is doing absolutely nothing. Nothing. And this is important. Because even for Christians, we feel like, oh, you know what? I, I, I made this mistake and I gave into this sin. And so now God is going to view me differently and love me less. And I'm going to have to try to do all of these things to get back into God's good graces. It's not how it works. It's not how it works. The moment you confess your sin, you are forgiven. There are no other sacrifices. There's no other compensation. There's no other, you know, exchange that needs to be made. Jesus already did it. And so when you're carrying your guilt around for sins that God has forgiven you of, you have to understand that God has separated you from that sin. You're a new creation in Christ. The old things have passed away, and behold, all has been made new. And it's this that we're looking at today. That we'd say, oh, you know, that's just the gospel. Well, yeah, sure, the gospel's woven through this, of course. But Jesus is the fulfillment of everything that came before him. But the practical aspects are innumerable. Because I wonder how many of you here today wrestle with guilt from past mistakes. Or maybe you feel like your future has imploded because of a sin that you committed. Well, sure, there's consequences to sin. Yeah, we get that. We reap what we sow. Sure, that's the truth. But in the sight of God, if you confess your sin, he's forgiven you of it. And he remembers it no more. It's not a covering it's not a compensation. It's a separation. And when you are separated from your sin, there is a huge, huge, huge relief. Because that weight is more than anyone can bear. Remember what it said? God laid on him the sins of the world. All of that weight, all of the regret, all of the sin, all of the shame, all of it, everything that we've been carrying around with us was already laid upon Jesus and he paid the price for it. That's why you can come boldly to the throne of grace in your time of need. And say, Lord, would you please forgive me? Would you please help me? And he says, yes. Go and sin no more. I'm with you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. My burden's easy. My yoke is light. And so we're going to pray. I'm going to invite the band to come up to close with worship. But I really felt like this morning there was something important that was supposed to take place in the spiritual realm. Not just in the intellectual, not just in the emotional, but most importantly in the spiritual state of who you are. Satan would love to continue to have your past thrown up in your face. Look at what you did. Look how you can't succeed. 
Look how you can't be victorious. Look how you can't move forward. They're all lies. They're all lies. And we should know. Because Jesus said that Satan, when he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. But they're so believable. And you want to know why they're so believable? Because they connect with us emotionally. And remember how many times we've said, Satan would love to fight you in the emotional realm, but not in the spiritual realm. Because if you fight in the spirit, you're greater than he. If you fight in the emotional, you're going to lose. Oh, that feels, oh, I know, it just feels, oh, I, I can't, oh, and then my thoughts are, and then my heart, and then my thoughts, and then my heart. That's why you need to know what the word of God says so that you might be victorious. And so what I felt the Lord put on my heart today to conclude our service this morning would be that if you've been carrying the guilt of sin and shame with you, if you have seen it, if you've seen something in your past be projected and interwoven in areas of your future that haven't even happened yet, today's a day that that needs to end. It needs to end. It needs to end. It needs to be done. It needs to be removed. It needs to be looked at for what it truly is. God desires for you to be forgiven and set free. And so I'm going to ask that you would just close your eyes and bow your head. And I believe that the word of God is living and is powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And I believe that the Holy Spirit is working today in this place. And I also believe in my heart of hearts that there are those of you that specifically needed to hear this today. Maybe you haven't even realized what a great shadow your past mistakes have cast on your future. Doesn't have to be that way any longer. And with every eye closed and every head bowed, If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus, if you're here today and at one point you would have said, you know, I I did know the Lord when I was younger, but I kind of lost my way. If that's you here today and you like to be forgiven of your sin, then I can lead you in a very simple prayer where you can find that forgiveness where you can be relieved of your burden, where you can find that future and hope. And if that's you and you've never given your life to Jesus and you like to be forgiven of your sin, then very simply, with every eye closed and head bowed, would you just hold your hand up and say, yeah, that's me. I like to be forgiven of my sin. I like to have a relationship with Jesus. Even if your heart, you feel a little nervous right now, it's okay, just raise your hand. The Lord through his Holy Spirit's drawing you to him. And also today, if you've walked away from the Lord and you feel like, oh man, I wanna come back to Jesus today. I'd like to give you that opportunity as well. Would you raise your hand? And I'm gonna lead you in a very simple prayer. And if you're watching online, you can pray this prayer as well. And as your hand goes up, lay your burden down. And just repeat this prayer after me. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask that you would forgive me of my sin and fill me with your Holy Spirit. I thank you that you love me, even knowing everything about me. I thank you that you sent your son, Jesus, to die on the cross for my sin. Would you fill me with your love and your joy and your peace? And give me your strength that I may be who you've created me to be. For I give you my life today. In Jesus' name. And also, just keep your eyes closed and your head bowed. The second part of what I felt the Lord put on my heart today was for Christians. For those of you here that have had things in your past mistakes, sin, accidental, on purpose, guilty by association, whatever the case may be. 
and it's been hanging over your head for a long time and you haven't been able to be free from it. I believe that whom Jesus sets free is free indeed. And so I'm gonna ask, again, with every eye closed and head bowed, and I don't think this point really needs to be beaten. It just needs to be simply asked. If you're here as a person professing faith in Jesus and you've been carrying guilt and shame from past mistakes and you'd like to be free from it, then you just raise your hand today and say, yes, that's me. Hold your hand up and I'm gonna pray for you right now. Anybody else, just hold your hand up and say, yeah, that's me. Satan loves condemning. He loves tripping up. He loves stumbling people. And then he also wants Christians to never realize their full potential in Christ because they believe the lie instead of looking to the truth. Any last ones, please raise your hand. I believe this is a very important part of understanding what we looked at today. Any last ones, raise your hand and then just picture in your mind that guilt, that shame. Lay it down at the feet of Jesus. And I'm gonna pray for you right now. Father, I pray for these men and women. Lord, I pray, God, as you know the deepest, darkest parts of who we are, I'm amazed that in spite of that, you love us with such a great love, that you desire that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so, Jesus, I ask in your name, Father, that you administer to your sons and daughters today. I ask, Lord, that these things that have been holding them back, weighing them down, Lord, you tell us in your word, you died for our sins, and with that, you died for our shame. You took the burden. You paid the price. And so, Lord, now I'm asking that according to your word, as you separate us from our sin, as you cleanse us, as you purify us, I am asking, based upon the promises found in your word, for that to be done here today. I pray that hard hearts would be softened. I pray that addictions would be broken. I pray for entrapments in the past, Lord, that those things would be completely done away with. Set the captive free. Open the eyes of the blind. And I pray, Lord, that you would not only remove those things that they have held on to for so long, or even those things that have been holding on to them. I pray that you would not only remove those things, Lord, but that you would replace them with your love, with your joy, with your peace, and your strength. Fill them afresh with your Holy Spirit and may they truly understand separation from their sin. You paid the price. And so, Lord, I pray that they would move forward from this day knowing that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. May they live not after the lust of the flesh. May they walk according to the Spirit. And we thank you, Lord, in faith for what you have done here today. And we ask, Lord, that this church would be pure and holy before you. Give us great boldness now as we step into the future that you've called us to walk in, Lord. We ask that we look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand. If you were one of those that prayed that prayer to dedicate or rededicate your life to Jesus, our prayer team will be available on my right, on your left. If you were one of those that raised your hand and were like, man, I've been carrying something with me for a long time, and today's the day that the Lord is setting me free from that, we would love to pray for you and come alongside you as the church should. Our prayer team will be available for you as well, and you can just simply say, hey, I, I raised my hand. Would you please pray for me? We got some great people that would love to do that. So today, as we conclude with worship, may the Lord bless you, may he keep you, May he cause his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.